Okay, folks, so check it out. Um, we always want to kind of bring in information, how it ties into your pocketbook when it comes to understanding that you need three buckets, the three bucket strategy. So let's talk a little bit right now about, you know, post midterm election, uh, no matter what side you're on, no matter what's going on, there always seems to be um, a strategy and a game within the game. And the Democrats have done a tremendous job at the whole mail-in process that the Republicans, at least in my opinion, need to catch up on. With that being said, though, 30-year interest rates had gone from 3 to 7%. That's pretty astronomical. We know that in the third quarter, um, equity in homes, it's been a loss of about a trillion dollars. That's a, that's a crazy number as well. And because layoffs are starting to happen, think of Facebook, think of Meta, about 11,000 layoffs happen. The recession continues, but what that does is begin to tame inflation. So the way you tame inflation, raise interest rates, people get laid off, and money in the pocket becomes scarce compared to where it was a year, two, and three years ago. We know that during COVID, we were at the greatest savings. Um, you know, the household in America's savings rate was incredible for many different reasons, but the truth is there was a lot of money in savings. All that's going south for the winter. Not only did the stock market go down, not only did we have some more continuous challenges in crypto and Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, but cryptocurrency, although Bitcoin's about to hit 16,000, but the kryptonites, I haven't seen them. I haven't heard from them. I don't know where they are. Some of these people were selling coaching programs that are now on islands and, and now they're teaching you how to sell and all this other crazy nonsense. At the end of the day, the kryptonite, don't let them in your house. Do not let the kryptonite in your house. And if somebody doesn't have a license where it comes to full planning, beware. Because at the end of the day, when you're just trading things for the short term, you're not going to be happy when stuff like this happens in our economy. So with that being said, though, um, we want to talk a little bit about this three-bucket strategy. I'm yeah. with my partner, Eddie James. What's up, man? How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. So what is this three-bucket strategy? I mean, people talk about a three-bucket strategy, Ed. Yeah. But like, what is it and how many people actually implement it? Well, you know, I think it, the way you look at a three bucket strategy is really short term, medium term, long term. Right. And so you have to start thinking about what are your goals and objectives? And I think that's really where it starts from a planning. Perspective. Can I ask a question? Because yeah. anyone that checks us out, we're always talking about goals and objectives. <laughs> right. We're always talking about right. a financial freedom app. And, and yeah, do do people really understand what it means to figure out each, because everyone's different, right? Yep. What their specific goals and objectives are and how they discover what they are and how they find out what was handed down emotionally and what isn't. And most importantly, are they in a scarce and abundant mindset? Speak to them. How do you, how do right. those people figure I, out what their goals and objectives are? I think where they start is like, what are, what are you looking to do? Right. And is it a lot, are the things that you're doing in savings aligned with what you just told us you want to do? Right. So, so do you ask the question is, do you ask your client a lot of questions of about course. that? Yeah. And when you ask those questions, can you tell if they're like either deleting, diluting or distorting, if they're irrational and how do you kind of shape them back into like, Hey, if you want to die, you gotta, you know, if you want to go to heaven, you got to die first. You can't just go to heaven. <laughs> Same thing with your money. Right. If you want this at that point, there has to be some level of sacrifice and commitment. How do you send that message? Well, Once it, again, we're talking about goals and objectives. Right. So just th think about it from this standpoint, right? We have clients that will sit down and tell us, you know, young clients just getting started in life and they want to buy a house, yep. right? But oftentimes you talk about things that are handed down from, you know, maybe their parents or other money, things that they've learned. And emotionally handed down. Yeah. Too. Yep. And, and so... What we find is a lot of times the only place they're saving money is in their 401k. Okay. And so if your goal is to buy a house, that house, you need to have a down payment. You need to be liquid for that. If the only spot you're saving is in your 401k, is that really the best strategy so, for that? Thank you, Ed. I'll, and we're going to play with that in a second because yep. I want to talk to these folks. What I'm hearing is that parents, uncles, aunts, planners tell us to do 401ks. And by the way, we're not saying they're bad. Right. To be clear. So what I'm really starting to realize is that the 401k industry is so brilliant that whenever somebody gets a job, that's always part of the overall plan and it yes. becomes robotic and people, because in their mind, they're losing money out of their paycheck every month, think they're actually saving um, for retirement, which they are. Yes. But the question is, is that the most optimal? Is that the most highest performing habit when it comes to your money that you can do? Right. There's good habits. Saving in a 401k is a good habit, but is it a highest performing habit? Check out Brendan Bouchard. He'll let you know about that. <laughs> yeah. But let's stick with goals and objectives. So so if we go back to that, right, and, and you know that that client wants to buy a house in the next three to five years, 
Well, that's not a long term goal, which long term bucket, right? If we're talking three bucks, we're still strategy. in short term. Yeah. Short term, just so I know, less than 12 months. Yeah. I, I would say short term is your liquid money that you need access to, you know, for, for your short term needs. So that's like less than 12 months. Yeah. Okay. A, a year top. So right? let's go back to goals and objectives, though. Yeah. How do you tell some, how do you figure out what somebody's goals and objectives are? Well, you, you got to ask them questions. But how can you tell they're in line with what you're saying? So what we find out is what are the things that they've been doing, yep. right? As far as it relates to their money and savings and all that sort of stuff. And knowing what their goal is, we can then start to see, okay, well, are you on the right path to get to where you want to be? Because if you want to buy a house in the next three to five years, do you want all of your savings to be in 401k, which is tied to the stock market, right? Because- So when, you're not going to tell someone to borrow from a 401k to pay for the first house, are you? I, I don't think that would be the yeah. optimal strategy. Nor do I. Um, so Unless you're never going to contribute to the 401k again. Well, I, I think, you know, you've we've talked about this before, right? And people don't understand what it means to borrow from their 401k because they'll take money out of that 401k and they have put in that money pre-tax. Yep. Now they take it out. They borrow. Yep. Yep. They've borrowed it. They pay an interest rate. And when they're paying it back, they're paying back with after-tax dollars. To get taxed again later on in ordinary income and retirement. So- it, if you're talking to someone that wants to buy a house, they got to save 20%. Do you map that out on a monthly basis? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we look at what that is. Is that something that they can achieve? If it's important to them, right, they're going to find out. But also, you know, when somebody just says, hey, I want to buy a house. Well, what's what kind of house do you want? Yep. You know, what's your what's your budget? Credit Have you score. thought about that? Yeah. Credit score. Can you get pre-approved for a mortgage, yep. right? And start to figure out all these different components, which go into, which is far more than just like going on Zillow and looking at homes. Yes, right, exactly. So you're saying a lot of great things. Now, when somebody has goals and objectives, like there's 10 people that come in and say the same thing. What's the difference that you see that really has people hit that target versus people that don't besides discipline? And if they can't get discipline, how do you teach them? What are your... Models and methodologies. This is outside of financial planning, yeah. folks. This is peak performance training. So write this down. Take a pen and piece of paper. Take that and rewind the back because this is the difference between good and great. What is? How do you? How do you say to somebody? All right, it's time to like you know really step up and, and get a chip on your shoulder, get an edge, <laughs> and wake up every day with a purpose. What, what do you do? About I think that? it becomes self evident through the questions that you ask. Okay. Right. I I don't. Th One of the things that we'll say to clients and talk about is you know on the Epic Wealth Builder when they're on that platform. They can what load is the Epic Wealth Builder. I'm sorry. It's one of financial planning platforms that we use. It helps aggregate all of their information awesome. in one place. So wait, these folks could have all their data on one landing page? Yes. And be able to kind of organize and structure everything so they can see things clear. Absolutely. Okay, got it. They can track their spending and all that, that ah, those habits, tell right? Tell the truth. But we don't have that data shared with us. Okay, why? Unless they, unless they decide to. If they decide to, they can. Got it. But to be honest, we don't want to be the people telling you you go out and spend too much. Yeah. Right? You're going to see that for yourself when you put the data there. Yeah. And it's going to be up to you to make that decision to make that change. Yeah. We can't, hmm. we can't tell you to make the change. You have to want it for yourself. Got right? It. It's like anything else. Um, but I think when, when people go through the process, they start to understand what they're trying to do and how the things that they've been doing don't align with what they're trying to do. They're going to make that decision to, to, to make that change, to make that shift, to, to start moving the money that they have around more optimally so they can achieve the life they want to achieve. Or they won't, right? Or they, or they or won't. They, it's just too much. Then you don't hear from them. So I think right. that, you know, when we look at the savings portion of it, they can opt us in if they really want help. But at the end of the day, um, when it comes to having a conversation about goals and objectives, the question is, what is the why on buying the house? And if they could get emotionally attached to that why, and it becomes a purpose that has more meaning than just buying a house, but, you know, having a house that you could raise your kids in where there's memories and they could bring their kids and the house has some kind of some kind of own its own personality based on the family. You have to kind of have these deeper conversations with folks, especially when they're first starting out, so they understand the difference between scarce and abundant mindset. Yeah. But also, I'm of the, and this is just me, I'm not telling you to do this, but whenever I hear the word sacrifice <laughs> or um, spend less, would that, that feels like principal office, right? So the real question <laughs> is, how can you make more money? Can you work overtime? Can you have a side job? Can you create a side business? What are some things that you can do to create more opportunities outside of your salary if you're nine to five? And at the end of the day, those things become really powerful because 
if you are making that extra money, you can always put it somewhere, somewhere yes. else in, yeah. in one of these savings tools. And and that's you know that's not just for the young people. That's of really course. for anybody out yeah. there. Yeah, right? go get that side hustle. Put down the potato chips. Stop watching a football <laughs> game on Sunday. And ahead. and it's and it's different in this economy. It's pretty easy to find different things, right? Well, hold on. Yep. That's a good point because we just talked about how there's people getting laid off. Yes. Right. Yeah. So what do you say to the folks out there? Is there job opportunities right now? I'm dead serious. I, I, I know you and I have a great thing, so I, I don't even know. I have no access. Look, my, my thought process behind that would be, you know, everybody needs to eat. There's food delivery service. I, Uber. I'm not saying, yeah, Uber Got Eats. It. I'm not saying that that's what you want to do, but I know people that are starting making a couple extra grand a month just renting out their car, like okay. a, a car that they don't need. So, you know, our society has changed. Like you used to have to go to Enterprise or wherever, Hertz or whatever the company is to go and rent a car. Now you could rent it from somebody online. They'll bring it to you. It's, really? Yeah. It's really simple. No way. Yeah. I swear to God. <laughs> oh my God. So you could actually. We've rent actually used that service. I used that service when we went to uh, Florida last year. They drove it to the airport, parked the car in short, short term par parking. We walked out, got the keys jumped in the car, left, and that's where we brought it back. To. Did it smell like it was cigarettes? Nothing. Was it, it was clean, clean beautiful. Wow. It was awesome. Great All right, so, so let's talk about these three, but we're in a short-term bucket still right yeah. now, which to me is a year or less. It's really about liquidity and cash. If there's yeah. a married couple that both work, they want three months of fixed bills. Yes. If it's one single wage earner, six months of fixed expenses, yes. right? From there, where else would this go besides, we know six months or three months is covered. Yeah. Is it all about just putting money and say, I know right now I'm 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 putting all my money in my my insurance as well as my savings account, yep. two separate accounts. I'm just like dumping as much as I can in there. So, so for me, I think the short term would be that emergency liquid savings that beyond the liquidity though. Be, beyond yeah. the emergency fund now. I, I wouldn't there's I would then if you have all of your emergency yeah. needs taken care of in that immediate bucket, yes, then I would shift to a, a mid mid range bucket and then yeah. So, so, so for, for anyone that's a really good saver that has a lot of liquidity and cash saved up, you're now going to be able to take advantage of things that are on deep discount, right? right? And be able to either start your own company. Like we're talking about starting two separate companies right yes. now, but also um, maybe without even taking money out of your pocket, go consult with somebody, get 20%, 10% of their company <laughs> and sharing the revenue of what you bring to the table. And that's a good way of of really duplicating your brain and, and what you do and what you bring yeah. to the table by tapping into either somebody's Facebook group or somebody's own sales team. Yeah. Right. So that's what's out there in these times of recession and people that take advantage of that, the ones when we get out of this recession, you know, there's going to be massive growth and opportunity for the people that are doing things today. Yeah. You know, one of the things you just touched on was, was you're putting money into your life insurance, right? And obviously people that watch our channel, they hear us talk about it all the time. Traditionally, the way a traditional life insurance is designed, that's more of a long term play. But in what we do and yeah. the way that we design these plans, um, they can be more of an intermediate and short term because there's liquidity and control inside of that. money. Oh, yeah. So, you know, outside of just your emergency liquid savings, if you're looking to save, that might be the next the next option to look at. Not the only option, but definitely somewhere where you want to explore. So what you're saying is if people have to overfund policies so they could access that at any given moment to yeah. take advantage of opportunities that can yeah. create cash flow. Yes. Awesome. And, and what about the folks? This is important right now. Yeah. You know, we'll have folks that will talk about IULs versus whole life. You know, the age old 20 year mm -hmm. conversation. I think the IUL was first created in 1997. So if you get an agent that's 35 years or less, they don't understand the stock market that goes down. What kind of damage are they doing to folks when they have them just put yeah. all their money in IUL and they make it about the stock market base? You know, you know, it won't go below zero. Yes. And with a cap on the upside, what kind of damage are they creating, especially when we're in a recession and you get two, three, four years mm -hmm. where, let's say the market just goes sideways for the next yeah. five years. Yeah, and, and, and that's possible, right? These things have happened before. So the argument will always be, look, you can't lose money in an IUL, right? Because your print, the, the, the accumulated value is protected. Yep. Meaning you get you get no downside of it, but you also get no interest rate credit. Yep. And none of the illustrations that they show you actually show markets not getting return. And right? these people, when they look at the illustration, don't read the disclaimer that says this is hypothetical yeah. only. Right. Yeah. And and even if you looked at the illustration, there is a guaranteed side to the IUL, but that guarantee lapses. Why? Because the guarantee portion doesn't have enough accumulation in it 
because it's not getting the interest rate that they showed you over here on this other side of the ledger. And it also has um, increasing insurance costs. Yeah. Right. And so if you're not IULs, if you're not funding them properly, if they're underfunded, um, you have increasing insurance costs that you have to deal with. You have different uh, pieces such as caps or spreads or all sorts of different things that the average look, it's not just the person buying it. It's the agent selling it that don't understand what they're talking about. So that's a really good point. So when somebody is looking at their IUL, right, and the market goes down, but each or if it stays the same and even goes up a little bit, but each year the cost of insurance becomes more expensive than mm -hmm. the year before, no matter what, no matter what. Right. And when you say that the guarantee lapses, Yes. What does that mean? Like we're two years old. So it means that your policy will lapse without value at a certain point in time. So if you look at the guarantee on most IUL illustrations, it will show you that at some point that that policy runs it. That death benefit goes away because there's no money in the policy. And the only choice. You mean if you're not contributing? No. As you contribute. It still runs out. Okay, I like to. Yeah, we should we should flash that up one time so people can actually see what yes. it looks like. That's a really good point. Um, and again, you were saying the only time. So, so and the the other piece that happens with IULs that I think people oftentimes get get confused on is, you know, the the insurance cost or or where you're charged insurance is the difference between the death benefit and the cash value, right? So the way they show these illustrations is as you accumulate more that cash value gets closer to the death benefit. And because that happens, that's offsetting internally for that rise in cost of insurance. But what happens when you set up this policy and now you wanna take money out from it? Tell me. So you start to take, your death benefit stays here, but you start taking money out. And now you've created more what's called net amount at risk. So you are now paying a larger portion on, on your insurance cost. And by the way, Every single year, that cost of insurance goes up for you, no matter what. When you say take it out, do you mean borrow or actually withdraw? Withdraw, borrow, well, leverage. Well, those are two different things. So. Well, d but in the in the insurance company's eyes, it doesn't make a difference to them because there you've increased now your net amount at risk. Got it. Inside of an IUL, it's it's completely different than some of these other products. Got it. So, how, so if a client's saying they're going to analyze an IUL, what would you tell them to do when they analyze it to make a Make a good decision. They're so, not all bad. Yep. Um, maybe the messaging on how they're delivered are bad or questionable at best. Yeah. But what what should they look at and, so, and be educated on? It really simple. Most IUL illustrations will have a guaranteed. It'll have a midpoint and it'll have you know illustrated like yeah. hypothetical. If you just look at the difference between the hypothetical and the midpoint, you'll see how interest rate sensitive these products are. Yeah. And know that at any time, the insurance company can change the rules of the game on how that interest rate is credited. So that's what you want to take a look at. Got it. And you really want to be able to understand that. So for the folks that are looking at mid, you know, the mid bucket or the long term bucket, these IULs fit both of those. And it's important to understand how that plays into it. Uh, just like when you buy real yeah. estate as an investment, it's mid to long term. It's definitely not short term. And you want to understand what that looks like as far as flipping versus buying and holding. I, th I think the flippers are in a lot of trouble right now. Mm -hmm. I look at some of these new home sales. They're giving discounts because they can't even get them off. They're not even finished yet. So because rates yeah. go higher and everything, there's a lot of challenges. And the question is, when you have these buckets, short term, mid term, long term, and the necessity of these buckets with a mindset that's tied to your uh, goals and objectives, how do you then deploy that money from a distribution and or other alternative investment strategy? Yeah. Well, obviously you want to keep your short term liquid liquid for emergencies and that sort of stuff. But, you know, medium term, I think, is that that investment, like while you're accumulating, that's really what you want to be doing. That's the bucket you want to save in to then go and redeploy into other areas, right? Other businesses, that sort of stuff or, or uh, you know, other real estate or whatever your investment choice is. That long term bucket for is is really your your retirement dollars, Got right? It. Those are those are dollars that you've put away, you've saved for for a long period of time. At some point, even when you retire, right? People might say, Oh, well, when I retire, everything's short term. No. Like when you retire, that money, whatever you've accumulated, now has to last the rest of your life. Yeah. And we don't know how long that is. Yeah, there's no there's no guarantee when you're gonna pass on. Right. So what you know. If any of these folks, if you have any questions, go ahead. You can always ask questions. Go ahead and click the link below. There's many different things you can link on. One of them is the 
Epic Wealth Builder. Uh, another one is the Epic Financial Freedom Map, where yeah. you know if you click onto that, it would give you a a nice little conversation about, hey man, where are you on the map? Where do you want to go? What is the strategy to get there most efficiently? If you want to do a a strategy on annuities with Ed, there's a link there for that as well. Yep. So go ahead and check all this stuff out down below, not to confuse you, and tell us if there's any videos that you want to see and watch. And you know, at the end of the day, we're here to kind of kind of drop nuggets on a daily basis. Yeah. When it comes to that, where, where, what is the best way for people to get grounded, to get started, and then be able to check on their stuff going forward? I think, honestly, the best thing they can do is reach out, have a conversation with one of, one of the team members here. They'll get them started on that path, whatever it is that they're looking to do. Um, just be, you know, understand that it's going to be about you. It's, it's really asking questions to figure out what you're trying to do. And if you're open and honest in those conversations, they'll be able to guide you in the best way possible. Yeah. It, it, the whole conversation is about compounding a product, but really your overall process when it comes to your money to create more time for yourself. That's recaptured and magic along the way. All of this is possible, you know, systematically, if in fact you're not looking for overnight success, instant gratification, we found that. Folks that are in a mindset of growth and contribution, uh, the art of living is giving. Stay in that mindset. You'll be amazed at how the universe conspires frequency-wise in your favor to get multiple use of each and every dollar. Thanks for checking us out. Once again, go ahead, click the link below. Continue to follow, and thank you so much.